an original MCM production. So now I'd like to uh, ask Dave McClurg to come forward to introduce our speaker. Thank you, President Dan. It's my pleasure today to introduce Joe Abraham. Joe is a serial entrepreneur who has built three companies on his own and participated in over 50 additional high growth companies in the role of advisor, executive, or co-founder. He is an award-winning author, a thought leader, and a speaker who travels the globe sharing his insights on entrepreneurship. Joe is creator of the Bozzi Framework, a methodology he will be describing today that is used by top MBA programs, owner-operated businesses, and Fortune 500 companies. He's also the author of a book entitled Entrepreneurial DNA, The Breakthrough Discovery That Aligns Your Business to Your Unique Strengths. This critically acclaimed book, based on Joe's extensive research into entrepreneurial companies, has resulted in his receipt of numerous awards and appearances on Fox News, CNN, ABC, CBS, and other media outlets as an expert on small business entrepreneurship, and free enterprise. In addition to his role as founder of Bozzi Global, a consulting firm that acts as an operating partner to a $100 million portfolio of venture-backed and privately held companies, Joe serves on the board of several high-growth companies and nonprofit organizations. Please join me in giving Joe Abraham a warm ro rotary welcome. Dave, and thank you everybody from Rotary. I'm excited to be here today. Um, I'm going to have to, for those of you that have seen me before, I'm going to have to take what I usually take hours and hours and hours to do and crunch it into about 20 minutes. So this will be an interesting exercise for me. I've done it once before in 18 minutes. Let's see if I can do it for you in 20. Uh, one of the questions people ask is, you know, when someone like Dave says, Joe is Joe's company's an operating partner, what in the world is that? It's not a usual term you hear every day. Essentially what we do, and I've had a, the, the joy of doing this since 2005, is uh, we find great companies that are stuck, and we make them unstuck, we grow them, we scale them, and then we sell them. And uh, usually we're doing that in partnership with the owner of the company who is frustrated that their company hasn't grown fast enough, and we bring people who've built high growth companies before alongside them and we grow businesses. So that's what we get to do for a living, and we have a lot of fun doing it. And it was doing what we were doing, that uh, led to the discovery that I'm going to share with you today and run you through very, very quickly. So it started in 2005. In 2004, I had sold my last company. I was bored out of my mind. By 2005, I started to make some small investments um, into local businesses and grow them with business owners. And uh, by 2008, I was working with a handful of companies in my little portfolio and ran into the discovery we'll learn about. So that was part one of the discovery, was understanding business owners and how they think. And then part two of the discovery happened a couple years later, which is really our focus for our time together today, which is uh, much more than just the business owner, we had a big aha about how teams operate in organizations and the fact that uh, teams have something called entrepreneurial DNA. When I first started my work, I just assumed entrepreneurs have entrepreneurial DNA. They have this. They have a way they do things. They have a way they make decisions. And uh, only after researching enough entrepreneurs, about 5,000 entrepreneurs into it and studying their businesses, I realized, wait a minute, there's a little entrepreneur inside every single person in every single organization, whether they're working in a church or a nonprofit or a high growth company or a big business. There's a little bit of an entrepreneur inside every one of us. And my goal for you today, whether you're a student getting ready to go to college or whether you're 101, 
is to help you identify which of these DNAs are in you because it's going to give you a lot of insight into how you make decisions and what the best seat on the bus is for you and the company you're working with or, or growing and also how to look at the people around you on your team people who report to you people you report to and say how are they wired and how does that impact the decisions I make I'll start by giving you a silly analogy though um, take a look at those characters on your screen and ask yourself this question are they the same the dogs, I know that, they, they bark, they have fur, they uh, leave landmines on your yard. But are they wired to do the same things? If, or do they have the same strengths and weaknesses, let's say? If we had to take the money in every wallet here and put it on a bet that the beagle will be able to beat the greyhound in a race around the track, would we do it? No, we wouldn't have to do a lot of research, right? We just have to look at that greyhound and go, well, he looks pretty fast. He's probably going to win. How about these two characters? Take a close look at them, and I'll tell you that there's a job interview for Scary Guard Dog. <laughs> Who's getting the job? Is there an obvious winner? OK. Silly analogy, obviously, to paint a picture for you and say, are they the same? You'll recognize most, if not all, those faces. They're all multi-billionaire, gazillionaire, celebrity entrepreneurs that we hear about every single day, are they really the same? Yes, they built massive organizations that changed the world, but do they think the same? Do they make decisions the same? Are their strengths and weaknesses the same? Are the teams that surround them the same? It took me a while to figure this out because I was working with much smaller versions of these entrepreneurs, people like you and me and some of the business leaders in this room, and I started to find that I was trying to, to make all entrepreneurs, all business leaders, all senior executives fit in one box. And along the way, someone would say, well, no, we have different personality traits. And so I put a bunch of people through personality assessments and found that most entrepreneurs, most business leaders, have about the same personality. They're all on a disk profile that all be DIs, dominant influencers. And even though their personality traits were the same, and if we were to assess these four characters, we would find very similar personality traits. How they made decisions in business and what their business strengths and weaknesses were, were completely different. And that's what we're going to unpack really, really quickly together. Knowing that I could put you through four hours of this, just know I got to get through it really, really fast. So here's what I discovered. As I just started asking people like you and me, I started asking people like you questions like, hey, why did you even take that job? What was your motivation for starting that company? Uh, what are the things that energize you about showing up to work? And what are the things that absolutely drain you? Right? Where do you feel like your best spot in the company is? Just simple questions like that. And we started to realize that, and then I started to study these rock star entrepreneurs and started to realize that they segment themselves, just like you and I do, on a quadrant um, of decision making. Not personality, but how we make decisions and how we see the world. We started to discover that um, a guy like Steve Jobs has a very different, what we call, entrepreneurial DNA than a Marcus Lemonis. How many of you have seen Marcus Lemonis on that TV show, The Prophet? I strongly recommend that TV show. I, I, I'm not a big promoter of television shows, but this is an excellent, excellent show. It's on CNBC. It's called The Prophet, and he goes in and transforms small companies. And it's very inspiring, very, very good, and a true uh, test uh, of what this builder DNA is. Or you look at a Richard Branson and we try and compare him to, to a Bill Gates and say, are they really the same are they, or are they different? Well, we discovered that entrepreneurs really fall and business owners and leaders fall in these four different quadrants. And so that's where Bossy comes from. When Dave introduced me, he said, Joe runs a company called Bossy Global. Well, that's where Bossy comes from. It's acronym for Builder, Opportunist, Specialist, and Innovator. Those are the four DNAs, and they're fairly descriptive of how these individuals make decisions. Let me unpack it for you really, really fast. We find that specialist DNA, it's a, a behavioral profile that activates an individuals as soon as they've established some sort of expertise. And there's a lot of you in this room right now. Right, so you've been through years and years of schooling or apprenticeship or on-the-job training. You've developed some knowledge base. Uh, young man, you're going to be going to school for engineering, right? You're going to, he's going to come out of school automatically wired as a specialist because of all that investment he's about to make into that knowledge of being an engineer. That'll, by default, make him a specialist as he enters the workforce. About 45% of all people 
in the business world, whether they're business owners or working in a company, show this as their primary DNA. Experts at some things, lawyers, accountants, graphic designers, chiropractors, IT people, you name it, uh, will show this DNA. What's interesting about these individuals is when you put them in a work environment, they make most of their decisions through a lens called reputation. How is this decision I'm about to make, to purchase something, to hire somebody, to fire somebody, to invest in something, how is it going to affect our reputation? Because they've spent a lifetime building that expertise. You see law firms and accounting firms and banks struggle a lot with this, the concept of, well, we got to grow, we got to expand, we got to hire more people. And then there's this question of, yeah, but what could that, how could that affect our reputation? A lot of SDNA company owners uh, have to make their decisions through this lens, reputation. Completely different from them. So if you think of an S, that would be like a Bill Gates. S's tend to pick one industry, engineering, IT, and they stay in it for a lifetime. And they go deeper and deeper into that expertise, become more trusted and respected in that industry, and make their money in one industry. Completely different from what we call opportunist DNA. These are the people who want to make money, and they want to make it fast. They don't want to do it in one industry. They would prefer to do it in six industries at the same time. So if you, uh, I'm not, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, Richard Branson, who we saw on screen a few minutes ago. Do you know how many companies he started to date? Unlike Bill Gates, who started one, Microsoft, and ran it for decades, uh, he's, Richard Branson starts a new venture about every 16 minutes. Right? His first book was called Screw It, Let's Do It. Now, if you were to put those two individuals in the room who built two very successful businesses but went about it very, very differently, one guy picks an IT company and builds it, the other guy's starting a record label and then a mobile phone company and then an airline and then he's flying people into outer space, how are those two individuals making decisions so differently and who needs to be on their team to handle that? Can you imagine working for Bill Gates one day and then going to work for Richard Branson the next day? Very different individuals, very different decisions in business. Opportunist DNA, we see it a lot in professional salespeople and rainmakers. So for you, those of you that are business owners in the room, if you're struggling with new business, you've got to find opportunists in your, to hire because those are the only ones who are going to be willing to go out there and make it rain. It's pre-wired into them. There's a set of traits that we can unpack for you over hours and hours, but it's pre-wired into these people. S's and O's, just so you know, in business are complete opposites. They see the world differently, they have different motivations, they show up to work for different reasons, and each thinks that the other one is completely nuts. <laughs> and in each of your companies, chances are there are some S's, the experts, the people who make sure everything's done and shipped on time, the customer's happy and the paperwork's done, and then there's a bunch of lunatic O's who are supposed to be the rainmakers who never file their paperwork, who are off chasing, you know, who knows what, shaking hands, kissing babies, and now, you leaders have to figure out how to get them to understand each other and still work together. Uh, that's the joy of, of business. Uh, just so you know, what drives most of an opportunist decision making is freedom. I'm coming to work for you so I can make a lot of money and then cash out, you know, when you sell the company or something, and then I get to sit on a beach, sip a Mai Tai, never have to work again. So this is why salespeople are drawn to work for you, is just how big is the commission structure and how much money can I make and how quickly can I then sit back and do what I really want to do. All right, those two groups, as you can just do the quick math, you'll see that S's and O's make up a majority of people in business. But there are a couple of minority groups when it comes to, and that's the builders and innovators. Innovators are the mad scientists out there. These are highly creative people who are always developing something new. They're creating, inventing, tinkering in an area of passion or expertise. They could be playing in the kitchen with grandma's cookie recipe, and they whip up a batch of cookies that everyone's like, oh, you got to sell these cookies. You could make a million bucks. Or they could be in the garage playing with their favorite engine, and then they stumble across a green technology. They're just highly creative people, uh, people at heart. They tend to invent and create all the intellectual property of our world. So the intellectual property lawyers in the room, that's your customer and they're very easy to find now because they'll tell you uh, who they are it, through this process. They make their decisions through the lens of mission because they're here to change the world. When, when they find something they believe in, they invent it, they create it, or they find a mission to pursue, that's what drives their decisions. We are finding, and this is important for all of you to know, we are finding that more and more of the millennial group 
skews very heavy on the right side of the quadrant. They are very missional and they're very opportunistic. They are innovators and opportunists at heart. They are not looking to come work for your company for 40 years and collect a paycheck and have a pension. They, are, they see work as just something you do to enjoy life. And the, so as for those of you that are in hiring mode and you're going to be hiring millennials, you have to start understanding that they aren't coming to work for you for a paycheck. They're coming to change the world. And your, the question for you is how are you doing that in the company and how can you incentivize them to be part of that uh, with you? But Steve Jobs is a great example of innovator, mad scientist, change the world kind of DNA. Their opposite is what we call builder. Builder DNA, the rarest of them all, are the type of people who can step into a business or in any kind of business environment and scale that business almost effortlessly. When I was doing the research, I saw that builders will step into a company that's maybe doing a couple million a year and grow to 18, 20, 50, 100 million like that. It doesn't take them decades. It doesn't take them a long time. Within years, they've got the business scaling very, very quickly because their decision lens through which they make all their business decisions is this thing called infrastructure. If you want, if you want to know if you're dealing with a builder, just ask them, hey, how do you measure success? How do you know things are going well? And a builder only has one set of measures. Um, how many square feet of office space do we now have? How many new locations did we open up? How many trucks do we have on the road? How badly do we crush our competition this week? Never ever will a builder look at how much money they have in their bank account, because they'll typically blow by any income goal very, very quickly. For them, it's infrastructure grab, and that's what they're looking for. And that's why they're able to come in and design and deploy strategy for high growth. So, for the, again, for those of you that are leading organizations or nonprofits or small businesses and you're like, well, we got to scale the business, we got to really expand, then you've got to look at your team and say, do I or the people around me have this pre-wiring? Because if they don't, it probably isn't going to happen. All right. You can learn a lot more about all this, this DNA stuff in the book. Um, I think Scott has maybe 10 copies here today. So you, you're welcome to grab a copy or grab it on Amazon. But let me show you really quickly. So I've said all that to really talk about what we're going to talk about now for the next 10 minutes. And that is, how does individual DNA play into a team's DNA? Because it's one thing for you as a leader to kind of figure out what the, this whole, what your entrepreneurial DNA is. By the way, here comes the big pitch. I want you all to take the assessment. It's available online, but it's free. All right, so if you just go to our website, just Google Bossy or Bossy DNA, you'll find it. And the assessment's absolutely free. We've got a student version, we've got an employer version, all kinds of versions. Take the assessment, that'll help you figure out what your DNA is, but that's just the tip of the iceberg as far as I'm concerned. The question is, who are the people surrounding you? Both as whether they're business partners or key employees, competitors, even for those of you that target business leaders for your customer. How do you start to identify their DNA because they have very different buying habits and very different motivations. So let me show you two quick case studies of how DNA impacts a company or a team's result. And hopefully as I share this with you, you'll have an aha about your company or the organization you work with. This particular business is based in Chicago that I'm gonna show you. I'm just gonna show you their team on our quadrant because we had their team take all get assessed and then we just plotted them. Okay, so this particular owner, he owns an insurance brokerage firm, very successful business in the Chicago area. Uh, they've been around for almost 20 years, multi, multi-million dollar producer, and uh, very successful. I had a chance to meet him at an event, and he said, hey, Joe, this DNA stuff is fascinating. He took the assessment. We were debriefing on his report right then and there, and he said, Joe, I get it, but here's my problem in business. He said, I got three problems that he identified for me. He said, problem number one in our company is we're just not scaling the way we used to. You know, he said, going back to the early days of our company, we were growing 20%, 50%. A couple of years, we doubled, tripled in, in revenue, and those were the fun days. But over the last several years, it just seems like we've been somewhat flat. He said, that's frustrating me. He said, number two frustration, we don't seem to be bringing in a lot of new business. You know, we've got this huge base of existing customers, and we take excellent care of them. But when it comes to getting new customers, new members, not so good, and that's frustrating me. And he said, the third thing is, we just seem out of fresh ideas. You know, we're showing up, we're doing our thing, we got happy customers, everything's fine, but we're just feeling kind of me too. Those were his three complaints. So we said, okay, well, what's his result? He 
uh, let me show you him in a second. We know that as we look at his team, anybody who ends up in the builder category, or in your group, anyone who ends up as a builder, are the people who are going to be more likely to scale the business. Anybody who ends up in the O quadrant will be pre-wired for new business development, selling. Anyone who ends up in the S would be the service, take care of customers kind of people. And then this is where all the creativity comes from, the I quadrant, all the innovation. So he showed up right there. An S, a specialist, with some innovator DNA. That's why he's in the S quadrant moving towards the I. So he's an SI, what we call lower quadrant entrepreneur. SIs. He's a specialist, really cares about his customer, takes excellent care of them, very well respected in his community, a trusted advisor. He was right on point. But remember his problems? We're not scaling the way we should. We aren't bringing in a lot of new business. And we seem out of fresh ideas. Ready to see his team? That's his team. I couldn't have planned this. It just happened this way. Now, the brown dots represent his management team. So you can see those. Um, the red dots represent the client service team, the people who are answering phones, making sure customers are happy. The blue dots represent the sales team. Remember what he said, we're not scaling the way we should, we're not bringing in a lot of new business, and we seem out of fresh ideas. So that was the beginning of my aha moment when I realized maybe company results can be tracked back to who we have on the bus with us. Because, for example, if I've got a specialist, someone who thinks like a specialist, but I've given them a sales role, and I need them to go hunting, but they really considered themselves a, an, an expert. We found that S's hate selling. They hate salespeople, right? To them, to an S, salespeople are like Leisure Suit Larry trying to hawk stuff. And so the last thing an S who's built up all this expertise needs is to go look like that. So what do we do? We wait for the phone to ring. Meanwhile, there's people out there who are born hunters, but they will show more of that opportunist DNA. Or let's say, we're not we need some help with marketing, and we hire a marketing guy or marketing gal, but she shows a lot of SDNA. Well, as an S, as a specialist, she's gonna help us with our marketing, but she's gonna do very cookie cutter marketing. She's gonna do what's safe and predictable. Versus an innovator marketer, and a marketing person with an IDNA is gonna come in with a very different set of skill sets. Does that make sense? So as you start to unpack this, you start to see that, wait, Everybody I've already hired has a DNA, and the people I plan to hire have a DNA. As some of you who go to school, you're going to be, your professors are going to put you in teams to do different projects. I wonder if you can use this just in the back of your mind going, okay, you're not on my team, you're, I'm going to take you. Why? Because there's something complementary. Maybe you know that you're an innovator at heart, you're a very creative person. Well, you may need that builder on your team, or you may need that opportunist on your team who's going to go out and sell the idea that your professor is asking you to create. Versus doing what this entrepreneur did, which is what a lot of us do, he picked a bunch of people just like him. And what happened? Some really good things happened in his business. Their customer service scores off the charts. Customers love this company. You couldn't pay their customers to leave because that's what S's do really well. But it also accentuated the weaknesses of the missing DNAs, which is new business and creativity, right? So just something for us to all wonder and hold ourselves accountable to. Really quickly, one more quick one. Remember again, what we expect to see. This I'm gonna show you really quickly. The management team of a technology company. Now this management team was really frustrated because they said, look, we've got all these plans. We've, we know where we're gonna take this company. We're in a high growth industry. They're in medical technology. But we just can't get our staff, 20,000 employees, by the way, we just can't get this staff to get it. They're just kind of stuck. We've got the plans. We've got the strategy. We know where we want to go, but they won't get it. Okay, so when I say technology company, you should automatically think Bill Gates. And when you think Bill Gates, you should think which DNA? S, right? Specialists who don't like to rock the boat, who want things stable and predictable, who have a reputation to protect, so lots of crazy ideas and swing for the fences isn't going to excite them. Here's the management team of this very big technology company. Just take a look and see which part of the quadrant is heavy. Is it the left, the right, the top, or the bottom? Obviously the top, right? So a lot of builders, a lot of opportunists. So imagine these individuals in management are thinking scale, they're thinking growth, they're thinking let's go out and generate lots of new business, let's come up with lots of fresh ideas, but working for them are a bunch of S's and I's, technology people. 
Can you see what the gap would be? They speak very different languages, literally, right? So if I'm on that management team and I've got lots of big ideas and I bring my technology team in to say, hey gang, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna to expand to these new locations. We're gonna launch 17 new products. We're gonna take over the world. What's the technology guy or gal sitting there thinking? Here's all the things that could go wrong. There's, how's this gonna affect my job? How much more work am I gonna to have to do? How's this gonna make us look in the marketplace? And then the frustration builds. I just want you to just think about your team whether it's the team that you volunteer with at your church or here at the Rotary or a team that reports to you in a company or the team that you advise, every team has DNA and it plays out this way. I've got five minutes to wrap you up. What I want to quickly show you is how this plays out in real life, in businesses in, and in nonprofits. It doesn't really matter. Depending on which DNA is most dominant. So if you have an organization that's very strong with builder DNA, you can expect the good thing that'll be happening is there'll be a ton of growth. There'll be expansion happening everywhere. The not so good part, builders have a tendency to burn through people like a tornado in Wichita. Because builders, people with this DNA, are like Ferraris going 200 miles an hour, and you and I are like Hondas going 40 miles an hour, cutting them off all the time. And so builders have a tendency to just rip people's heads off fairly randomly in staff meetings and you, whatever it may be. So as a result, companies with high builder DNA have very high turnover. A lot of employees changing hands, executives leaving going, this, I can't work for this lunatic. Yes, we're growing, but I don't like being here. Just know that that's a key trait. With opportunist DNA, so picture a Richard Branson-like company, you can expect that there'll always be a big pipeline of new opportunity. New business will not be a problem. You know what the problem will be? getting those customers to stay. Because we promised them a bunch of stuff and we had a bunch of opportunists who didn't really care whether the product shipped on time or whether it was the right product in the box because we were off chasing the next shiny object. And so, uh, yeah, a lot of customer, retaining customers becomes a challenge when opportunist DNA is very high. When specialist DNA is high, this is the flip of it. So picture almost every law firm, accounting firm, and bank in town. Um, the good thing will be very satisfied customers. They love you because once, once they're your customer, you're going to take excellent care of them. The not so good part, uh, lead generation, getting new customers in the door, hunting for new business, it doesn't come naturally to SDNA. So don't beat yourself up about it. It's pre-wired into you. It's what makes you so amazing at what you do. You have to be not so amazing at something. So lead generation is your thing. And there's a tendency for most SDNA organizations to hit a plateau. Whether that plateau is at 400,000 in revenue or 400 million in revenue, most SDNA organizations hit a growth plateau at some point. Innovator DNA, you know you're dealing with innovator DNA when they're doing something so different that no one else is doing it. You notice that restaurant you walk into and there's no printed menus because every day that particular chef is gonna show up at the office and go, uh, I'm gonna to go to the farmer's market, I'm gonna buy a few things, I'm gonna create art on your plate. And I don't know what it'll be today and I don't know what it'll be tomorrow, but it'll taste amazing. That's innovator DNA, because they're, they're basically artists at heart. You can assume the good thing will be they will always have breakthrough stuff. Apple is a great example of an innovator DNA company. There's always something new that no one else has thought of before that they bring to market. And then Microsoft will show up and come up with their version of it. And they're an S company. But here's the not so good part about iDNA. When, and this, is, this may upset a couple of you in the room who are eyes, who are holding on to the ownership or control of your business. Um, or those of you that are trusted advisors here, who advise companies in some way, shape, or form, you'll run into innovator DNA clients who have breakthrough technology, but they are running the company. Okay, it is a, it is a proven fact now through our research that innovators are horrible CEOs. Absolutely despicable. Um, I'll give you two examples. I'm one of them because my iDNA is high. I'm, I stepped out of the CEO role three years ago and gave up all control to my partner to run the company because eyes cannot make business decisions because it's all about the mission. Give you one more example. Let me see if I have it. Yep. Um, how many of you know the story? How many of you know the story of Steve Jobs? His business story? Okay. If you didn't know this, the first time he was CEO of Apple, he got fired. Does everyone know that? The board literally fired Steve Jobs, one of the founders of Apple. Why would they do that? It's because as an I, 
he was doing the role of a bee, a builder, and a specialist, and he was doing it not so well. When the first time he was CEO of Apple, uh, the company almost went under. It was a very amazing niche company. If you were an artist or a graphic designer, you loved Apple, but that's pretty much who cared about Apple back in the day. He was sitting on the wrong seat in his own bus. Now, here's what happened. He did get fired. He went away. And if those of you that follow the story, he went and did some really creative things with companies like Pixar and Disney and all that kind of stuff. He discovered who he really was as an entrepreneur. And then he came back to Apple as CEO again, except this time he did something different. Even though he took the title of CEO, he only had two responsibilities. In his previous company, when he was CEO of Apple, everybody reported to him. Here, only two groups reported to, to Steve Jobs. Product development and user experience. And it was after that that Apple became a $600 billion market cap company. Because he himself discovered who he was as an entrepreneur. He put himself on the right seat on the bus, and then, started to surround himself with people that complimented him. That's what turned Apple into the organization it did. Prior to that, when he didn't recognize who he was and he was trying to be someone he wasn't, some fairly disastrous things happened if you were a shareholder of that organization back in the day. So, in summary, what do you do about this? Perfect. I want you to think about this. What's your DNA? And I would really encourage you, go take the assessment. It's fun. It's 10 questions. It takes like two minutes to do, and you get your results instantly. And then ask yourself, based on at least what our assessment is telling you and what you know about yourself, uh, are you on the right seat on the bus in your career, in the organization you're with, in the seat that you're sitting in? And then, if you have a team surrounding you, who are those people on the bus and are they sitting on the right seat on the bus? Do a little quick little team assessment. If you've got five or ten people around you, just have everybody take the free assessment, send you their report, and kind of do your own little assessment. If you've got more than ten, I'd say, where's Scott? Scott's right here. Um, come talk to Scott. I'm about to do it. My partner would kill me. Um, for any of the Rotary, Rotary members, if you just come talk to Scott, you can do our team assessment on us. There's no cost for it. Normally it's hundreds of dollars, but it's on us. See, this is how eyes work. Um, <laughs> anyway, talk to Scott. He'll set you up with a team assessment because if you've got more than 10 people, you don't want to sit there doing it manually. It's too much of a pain. We'll do it, it's all digital, you get your results, we'll do a read back with you. But it's really important for the team that you're part of or the team that you lead, for you to start seeing them through the lens of their entrepreneurial DNA. It'll blow your mind how better you'll be able to manage up to people you report to, how well you'll be able to lead the people you're called to lead. Uh, you'll just start to see them differently and I think you'll see some amazing results in the process. How many business owners are in the room? Oh, cool. Take advantage of that team assessment if you don't mind. And then how many trusted advisors are here? People who business owners look at as, the per, as a go-to person for something. Super cool. Hey, listen, um, I'm done, but I just want to let you know that both in the month of August and in the month of September, we're hosting two complimentary workshops just for trusted advisors to unpack this for you over two hours. And you need it. We'll I'll, I'll be able to show you literally how to predict the next move your client's going to make. The good moves they're going to make and the dopey moves they're going to make because they will make a few and it's your job and mine as trusted advisors to in some cases advise and protect through those. As you understand the DNA of your client, you'll not only be able to sell to them better uh, and close more deals, you'll be able to serve them better. So again, just talk to Scott. Uh, it's a we're doing it in partnership with a couple of local banks. Um, and organizations, and we just love to have you come sit in. It's a couple hours. We'll do it first thing in the morning so you can catch your uh, 9 a.m. meetings and uh, look forward to seeing you there. Hey, everyone, just think about this. Uh, even though we're similar in many ways, we're different. Every one of us, students and the wealthiest person in this room, we all come to the table with certain amazing gifts. The question is, what's yours? And how do you surround yourself with people that compliment you? That's the, the art and science of building great organizations. Thanks for having me here.
MCM production.